Hey, welcome to Ryan's Garage Season 2. We finally got renewed. <laughs> we thought we got canceled, but here we are. Hey, I'm Alex. I'm new here. We just hired him. <laughs> hey, I'm Ryan, um, and I only have tools to work on BMWs. Do you want to do a real one? A real intro? What, what are we saying? Hey, I'm Ryan, and I'm just trying to figure this out right now. Hey, I'm Alex, and uh, this feels pretty sketchy. <laughs> Do what I'm doing. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Very intense. Yeah. Lots of cameras. Here. And not oh. terrible handwriting. Are we starting? Is this yeah. on? It's just rolling. We're doing um, it. So we, we're going to start with the needs? Yeah, so we want things where we can drive the car. Like that, yeah. I think that's the most important thing, is we want things to fail, and we want to find out how they fail on the road. So what do we need to do to get the car drivable? I think the wheels and tires is like definitely number one, uh, okay. whether that's the spacers, or I don't think it's a bad idea to do like air filter and some of the, the basics, so spark plugs, air filter, probably an oil change wouldn't hurt either. Do we want to do ignition coil? Yeah, we could do ignition coil, it wouldn't hurt. Do we want to hold off on the alternator, do we want to swap that now? Definitely has some weird wiring that we want to check out. Um, okay, so I'll say alternate wiring. Yeah, alternate wiring. It's, it looks like someone modified it used crimp connectors, which are fine, uh, but then they, they start corroding and falling apart after a certain amount of time. So well, that's good when you're going off roading. <laughs> I think that should be good for now. Try it out. Let's do it. Don't show anyone I'm using a chrome bit on a uh, impact gun because <laughs> yeah. the internet won't eat me alive for that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Don't ever do this. <laughs> it's really important you don't do exactly what I'm doing. Is that we're using an impact gun like this. Uh, if you use a chrome bit, they can actually fracture off and fly off and, and start causing damage to either the vehicle or your eyes. Um, so don't do what I'm doing. Do as I say, not as I do. I used my chrome one a ton until I saw some video that was like, yeah, don't do that. And I was like, right, don't do that. <laughs> so it's really important that you have it on jack stands. But another kind of safety measure, if you want, is you take your your wheel that you have off like this. He plays it under the car. So it takes three or four failures before you uh, are squished under the car, and I like to have as little failure points as possible. Safety first, baby. <laughs> these are wheel spacers, and these aren't preferred because you want to have your wheel straight against any kind of surface and have little, uh, to as little as possible failure points um, because it's your wheel going down the road. So the previous owner that got this car decided to put on these Jeep wheels, which is uh, fine and dandy, but they needed this additional hardware um, right. to make sure that they fit on the vehicle. Not a horrible idea, but uh, we're kind of deciding what we want to do with our tires and wheels. Is it a different pattern? Oh yeah, these look way off. Yeah. <laughs> Samsonite, I was way off. I just need a break, this is just this once, car gods. Well, we could start with the ignition coils. I mean, they're right here. Yeah. It's an inline four, and the plugs are going in on each side. And this motor's really weird because it's got uh, two per cylinder. And it's a four cylinder, so it's actually got eight spark plugs, and it's got two coil packs of four. Um, basically, an F1 engine at this point. Right up top. There you go. You're out. All right. We got this new ignition coil from carparts.com. Uh, it's one of the house brands we have. We're really excited to install it in the vehicle. Something that's really important on ignition coils is that each of these go directly to a cylinder, so you want to keep the same pattern it's in. So you want to match it up, make sure that, that the connectors all look the same, and they do here. This one's a little bit more cramped, so it's going to be a bit more difficult. I'm not nervous, it's just my hands are fat. So I'll just be a, a time lapse anyways. <laughs> There you go. I'm gonna do this tech tip here. So it's really important that you have a uh, extension here that, that can wiggle around. It gives you a little bit more extra room in there. And looks good to Perfect. <laughs> All right, intake back in. Let's fire her up. Couldn't have done it without Alex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did the real important job here. Okay. Make sure she's neutral. Is that really bad? <laughs> Is 
since I'm way less qualified than Ryan, I'm gonna do the really difficult job, which is changing the air filter. So in order to do that, we're gonna release that, pull that out, toss that thing. New air filter, help this thing breathe. Put that in there. Just get it over on there. <laughs> Early the next morning. Uh, it's driving okay. Fifth gear is almost completely useless because I think it's got those taller tires because it's a four cylinder. It's just got no guts. So you basically stay in fourth and third the whole time on the freeway, but it's driving okay. The steering wheel definitely is at like a 45 degree angle because it's not aligned correctly, but that's an easy fix. Um, I have a OBD2 reader sitting here on my lap, also just making sure that nothing crazy is going on. All in all, it seems amazing. I'm really proud of it. It seems like it's gonna be a great uh, truck for both the ride up and for the, the actual gambler. Only other problem, I don't really fit. I'm 6'2", 280 pounds, and every time I turn on the left blinker, my left knee turns it off, so there's that too. Eight hours later. Spark plugs? Spark plugs. I mean, and it's weird because it's a four cylinder, so it should have only four of them. But you know, as we, we kind of talked about earlier is that there's actually eight on this motor. And why they do that is kind of a long story. Uh, emissions is the short story, or, or just better power out of a smaller motor um, for better burn. But at the end of the day, it just makes it six times harder to replace them. What tools would you say they're like really important and necessary for this, Alex? Ideally, you have a, a spark plug socket that either has a magnet or a rubber grommet inside to hold it in place. Why is that important to have those? So that you don't crack the porcelain on the plug. Yeah, and also it helps like when you're pulling it out of a tight place like that, right? It does help. <laughs> so some, some of these sockets they have on them, you know, like you said, either plastic or a magnet. And we only had one that had plastic on it. So what we did is we took a magnet and just put it on the end of this extension and then put it within that socket like that. And now we have a kind of makeshift uh, spark plug socket. You mentioned makeshift. How much of this project do you think will be makeshift? <sighs> project mean the whole car, just what we're doing today. Honestly, anytime you work on a car, it's, it's pretty makeshift. The, the manuals will say something and online will say another thing. But the best thing to do is just get in there and try it out. It's it's really not as serious as they make it out to be. Um, a lot of times you can figure it out and, and see the part, see how it comes out, unplug it, plug it back in, and it'll be fine. As I've mentioned in my other videos, it's very important to keep your uh, company dog nice and ma well maintained while you're through the process. I'd say every half an hour or so, you make sure that you go use the back of your hand because you kind of got dirt and just give them some rubbins. And then you can put them back down and go back to working on the car. Thank you, sir. Uh, so still working on the truck and we has a parasitic drain which means that um, something is sitting there just constantly eating away at the battery and causing the battery to die which is not great because we want to drive it battery's dead and then you can you know disconnect the battery but it's better just have the parasitic drain figured out uh, so i'm going to show you guys real quick how to do a quick parasitic drain test not the ideal setup but we're doing what we have here um, so the, what you want to do is you want to get a multimeter or some way of measuring amperage connected through your system. You wanna include your multimeter as part of the circuit, the flow of the electronics here. So we have from our negative battery terminal all the way to our multimeter, which we have in a car, and then all the way back here again to the negative battery terminal. So what this is doing is it's measuring the amperage going through that. So you don't wanna start the car, you don't wanna turn anything on because most likely your multimeter can't handle that much amperage, but this is a great little way to, to test um, how many amps, and I think currently it's something like 240 milliamps, which is a non, uh, is a pretty significant number. So as you can see on the thing there, it's 240 milliamps that's flowing through that right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the fuse panel here, and I'm gonna pull each fuse at a time. It's a bit of a uh, tedious process until I see that go to zero, or close to zero, that is. And once I find that out, I can go back to the owner's manual um, or even using the internal reference diagrams inside the vehicle and find out which system is causing this parasitic drain. So we found our first interesting thing is that it's not one system causing the drain, it's multiple. So you see 240 milliamps up on the screen there in the red. And then we're gonna come down here, we're gonna pull this fuse right here, this little guy. And as I pull it, watch the milliamps go down to about 160. So I'm gonna plug it back in. So you see it says 160. It should go back up to 240. Strange. So some really strange behavior going on here. Um, this is fuse 27, which according to the diagrams is the daytime running lights um, and some other automatic transmission things, but we don't have to worry about that. 
But so check this out, is that this has uh, gone down since, and if you start messing with the, the headlight knob here, I'm going to turn it to on, and the amperage almost drops to zero, and then you're going to turn it off, and it goes back up high again. I think it has something to do with this beautiful wiring that the, uh, the previous owners have done in here. I think that some of those switches are still alive, or something strange is going on, with it and they, they tied into the, the lighting circuit, and something's not quite right, so... I'm gonna keep chasing this down, but it seems like faulty wiring. We're having some seriously wild swings. We start pulling the fuse for the instrument cluster, which hasn't really been working anyways, but we pull that out. So it goes back up to 240, which is the max that we saw it at. When you pull it out, it does some wild stuff and you hear relays clicking and all that fun stuff. So uh, a little bit more investigation work to do here. There it goes, so it goes down to 20. So it seems like the instrument cluster is also causing some problems, which we kind of knew was what was going on. It hasn't been working great anyways. You can hear it clicking like crazy when I start putting the fuse back in. There it goes, should go up to 240 again. So instrument cluster and daytime running lights seem to be causing most issues here. So while we're removing all the pieces for the belt, uh, we, we thought we might as well do the alternator while we're in here. It's just a good piece for uh, preventative maintenance, especially when you're off-roading. It's really important to have that working. So if you look at this, this is the alternator connector. It looks like someone did some work on it before and we're not sure uh, exactly what they did. So just to be careful, we're gonna just make sure that everything's crimped correctly, make sure that the connections are solid because if these fail, your whole charging system's gonna fail, which means that your battery's gonna die and you're gonna be stuck on the side of the road. So we're gonna just make sure that this is correct, make sure that nothing's you know gonna fall apart while we're on the road, replace the alternator and we'll be on our way. So when replacing parts, it's always good to compare your new parts to your old parts. Want to make sure the shape's the same, all of the connectors are in the same spot and look the same, that the overall vibe is the same, and I think it's the same. Okay, thanks. It's like putting or so it's really important that we, we talked about this earlier, but we want to remove these crimps just because we're unsure of the quality of them and if they're you know fully seated, because if one of them falls out, that's going to really cause a big problem on the road. Um, so the correct way to do it is cut those pieces, um, then you want to strip the wires off, tie them together, potentially solder, if not re-crimp them. So what we're going to do is we're going to take electrical tape and just kind of cover it up like that. So it's, it's very important that once you've you know, been working for a while, make sure your dog's not overheating. Um, on a hot day like this, if it doesn't have the correct radiation, it can actually end up um, overheating. So you'll just make sure you just take them and just put them a little bit in the shape like that.